Oh, hello, old friend. It's good to see you. Let's talk about this word, fascination. It describes an unquenchable urge which compels our hearts to quest and be captivated. As long as there are elegant explanations to complicated phenomena, science will never lose its romance. Over the years, I've traveled the world, indulging in my fascination in physics. And now, I find that a new hunger has woken within me. A fiery need to share these great ideas with the people around me. And so, I have assembled a team of some of the greatest, most lucid, most creative minds I've encountered in my travels. And I call them my titanium physicists. You're listening to the Titanium Physicist Podcast, and I'm Ben Tippett. And now, Allez, Physique! Okay, so, you're a baseball coach, and you've just got a new player on your team who's purported to be a great batter. You're so excited that you want to test out his reputation right away. So you take him to the local baseball diamond, and you give him a bucket of balls, and you tell him to start hitting the balls into the field, and then you go sit on the bench. Now, here's the problem. It's dark. It's night outside. It's too dark to see whether he's hit the ball, and too dark to see which direction and how far each ball has gone. The baseball field hasn't paid its electricity bill, so you can't just turn on some lights to see. All right, so take a second. Ask yourself how you'd come up with a solution to this particular problem. Well, welcome to the world of experimental particle physics. The theory says that some reaction is happening, but how do you figure out what's actually happened? How do you see what's just happened there? Okay, well, back to the baseball analogy. One thing you could do is tie a string around the baseball. If you could feel the string unravel as it pulled out, you could find out how far it's gone and which direction it moved, but the weight of the string would change the ball's trajectory a little bit. So I guess there's always a trade-off when you want to do some observations. Now, the batter isn't playing in a vacuum, so there's all sorts of evidence when he's hit the ball. You can hear the crack of the bat. You can also hear where the ball has landed. You could go out around to where the ball has landed and feel around with your hands to see where the grass is pushed down in the path of the ball, to see where it's rolled. So just so particle physicists are forced to think about and look for peripheral evidence to piece together what's happened. But okay, you say, listening to where the baseball lands is difficult. A baseball landing in the grass doesn't make much sound. So let's come up with a way to boost that signal. How about if we fill the outfield with little leaguers, little kids whose job it is to try to catch the balls. So when a baseball comes by, it'll hit the kid because they don't have much skills and it's dark. And so when they start shouting, it's much easier to hear a little kid shout when the baseball hits them, than to hear a ball land in the quiet grass. So in effect, you've built yourself a particle detector. And that's the topic of today's show, particle detectors. We're going to talk about the theories behind different detectors, how they work, their history, and eventually by the end of the show, we'll be talking about the compact muon solenoid and the atlas detectors at CERN. So you ask yourself, what kind of a human being would hit children with baseballs at night? Uh, maybe some kind of horrible monkey man. Maybe a hard-boiled monkey man who wears an eye patch. Today, our guest is Gareth L. Powell, author of the hit story, Akak Makak, the story of a hard-boiled monkey World War II spitfire pilot as he fights his way through an alternate history of Earth. Welcome to our show, Gareth. Hello. Hey, I'm excited. So, for you today, I've assembled two of my finest titanium physicists. Arise, Dr. Ken Clark. Whoosh. Ah, it's a bird, it's a plane. No, wait, it's Dr. Ken. Dr. Ken did his undergraduate at the University of Toronto and his master's and PhD at Queen's University, and he's now at Penn State working on Ice Cube. Now arise, Tia Michelli. 
Boing, boing, boing. Tia is a graduate student at the University of California, Davis, where she studies high-energy experimental particle physics, and she's now writing her thesis on extra dimensions. All right, everybody, let's talk about the history of particles and particle detection. Okay, so we're going to start off in 1896. This guy, Becquerel, was studying these uranium rocks that would glow in the dark. And he was done looking at them for the day, so he put them away in his drawer. And he didn't come back to them for a couple more days. He had some friends over and needed to get out some photographic paper in one of the drawers in his desk. And when he took out the paper, he saw that part of it was already developed. He's like, what are these weird splotches? And then he opens the drawer just above it where the uranium rocks were. And he sees that the photographic paper had the same outline as the rocks. Yeah, so that's the first particle detector. So we had particles coming out of this uranium rock that left evidence on the photographic paper. Yeah, so that's only important because it says, okay, there was something happening here. You know, we can't see anything else about it, but we see evidence that it's gone through this paper. So therefore... Oh, yeah, we've, we've detected something that we couldn't see, you know. I think it's a pretty cool story in the kind of history of particle detection. But they didn't know what they were seeing yet. So this guy was sort of handling around these raw lumps of uranium then, just sort of playing with them. As one did back then, and, yeah. and one does not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Died young, did he, by any chance? I suspect the answer is yes. Most of the kind of <laughs> physicists from that generation did not last long, unfortunately. Anyway... Yes, he was playing with the uranium chunks and, and found out that there was a way that he could find out particles had gone through his photographic paper. So where were the particles coming from? So they were, they were coming from the uranium. So, well, this isn't a stable isotope of uranium, which just means that it tends to decay. It tends to shoot off particles because it's energetically favorable that it does that. So as it sits there, it's just constantly shooting things off. And this is part of the problem. This is one of the reasons that uranium is so dangerous, of course, because those same particles can interfere with the cells in your body and, and do all sorts of terrible things, like give you cancer, unfortunately, when you lick them. But it's, it's shooting them off because of a, a reaction ongoing within the uranium itself. It's not reacting with the air or anything then. No, just the uranium itself. So the, the uranium in the way that it has been produced here is not stable. So it's, it always is trying to be stable. So it's, it's shooting off these particles in an effort to get to a stable state. And it will continue to do so until it reaches a stable state, in fact. And, and, and that's where we get the term half-life, isn't it? From half the time it takes to reach that stable state. Was that right? Yeah, exactly. Half-life is the length it takes for half of the particles to decay, essentially. And then different materials have different half-lives. So... Instead of waiting around to see when half of the stuff is decayed, instead you can measure the rate at which it decays. And that sort of leads us into what effectively is the, the next generation of particle detectors. So now that we know something's happened, we really want to know more information about what has happened here. We only have evidence that a particle went through, but we'd like to know things like, for example, how many times in a second these particles are detected. And so the next stage of particle detectors that we had are things like Geiger counters. And I think we'd like to talk about Geiger counters just because they're kind of so ubiquitous in movies and in science fiction and in stories and things. You know, people are always wandering around with these giant base suits on, listening to the ticking of their Geiger counter to try and figure out either if the world is habitable or if this terrible nuclear accident that they've just observed is as bad as they think or something like that. So the next stage, in instead of just having a developed piece of paper, now essentially you can tell when things are happening. And it's a pretty neat way to detect particles. You just fill a tube with gas and you put a charged wire down the center of the tube. So when your particle comes in, instead of hitting a piece of photographic paper and causing you know, this reaction that causes it to turn silver, now when your particle goes through, it runs into a lot of particles and it knocks electrons off of these atoms. So now, since you have these free electrons wandering around, you actually have the ability to gather them. So if you have this tube with a charged wire down the center, if you make that charged wire positive, then the electrons, which have a negative charge, are attracted to that wire. And as they travel towards the wire, 
they increase speed as they travel towards it and they cause other electrons to come off and you generate a lot of electrons onto this wire. And you can then monitor the wire and see when a lot of electrons uh, actually hit it. And that's what gives this clicking sound. So every time you get one of these clicking sounds, you've had a particle go through your Geiger tube. And so the more particles that go through, the more clicks. Exactly. So if it's just one particle every couple of seconds, you know, it's just this normal click. Or if you're standing, you know, in Chernobyl 10 years ago or 15, oh gosh, actually longer than that. Anyway, there's a lot of particles. So the clicks are going off all the time. So it's a good way to be able to tell not only that something has happened, but also how often that something happens. And then it was interesting also because... So you, you could tell that something came through and caused your Geiger counter to click. But you don't know necessarily how fast it was moving or what type of particle it was. So one advance in particle detection involves new types of detectors that don't just let you see that a particle has passed through or tells you what rate the particles have passed through, but also let you track individual particles. All right, Ken, cloud chambers. Right. So cloud chambers are really cool. You might have seen one in person. They're usually, you know, roughly coffee table sized and you find them in like the lobbies of a lot of physics buildings and stuff. They look a little bit like an aquarium. They have a liquid in it and then you can see things going on in the gas. Have you ever seen anything like that? No. That's okay. It's an archaic technology, so they are only in the lobbies, but... Yeah, they're usually just for show anymore, unfortunately. So the name of the game in particle detection is often amplification. What we want to do is create a scenario where your signal will get boosted uh, in such a way that it becomes detectable, even though the original particle moving through was kind of subtle. And the way cloud chambers work is actually really neat. So you know the water cycle, right? The water evaporates from the earth and then goes up into the sky, and then it's just water vapor. If the water vapor gets cool enough, the air can't hold the vaporized water well enough, and water droplets start condensing in place, right? And then big collections of those, we see them and call them clouds, right? Yeah. So the water always condenses around particulate. You need a seed in the clouds. So the little motes of dust and crap up there are, act as nuclei that the, that the water will condense around. So the idea here is that if you have a system where the air can't hold the vapor anymore and it wants to condense, but there, there aren't any nuclei for the water to condense around, then as soon as a, a, you know, a moat of a dust shows up, you know, a whole bunch of droplets of water will just all of a sudden accumulate on that droplet. So the deal is that you can make it so the air has more vapor in it than it can actually hold. That's called super cooled. And so one way you can cause condensation is if you shoot a charged particle through, as it bumps around, it'll create little pockets of charge that will act as nuclei for the water vapor or the alcohol vapor to condense around. And so what you can get is you build these big boxes and you, you fine tune the amount of vapor inside the box to its temperature so that the air is holding slightly more vapor than it actually should be able to hold given its temperature. And then if a particle zips through, like a cloud will form on its trail, the same way an airplane traveling through the atmosphere will create a trail of condensation behind it. Mm-hmm. Electrons passing through these chambers cause a line of clouds behind them. And so you take one of these boxes, and if there's anything radioactive nearby, and incidentally, there is lots of natural radiation, so there's lots of particles zipping through this box. Each time a particle zips through, you'll see a line form. And these lines form dynamically depending on what's just passed through. So it's absolutely fantastic. You can literally see the particles moving through the box based on their trail. Do different particles make different trails? Oh, there's a good question, yeah. So what you normally do with one of these boxes is you put it in a magnetic field. And the reason that you do that is because since these particles are charged and moving, the magnetic field will actually bend their movement. It will cause them to change direction. And the amount that they change direction will be proportional to their mass. So you can actually start telling particles apart. Since they're all traveling through the same magnetic field, heavier particles will be bent less and lighter particles will be bent more in the magnetic field. In fact, once you can recognize these photos, they, they show up all the time in popular physics articles and uh, you know physics textbooks. They're everywhere because what you see is if a charged particle is moving through this magnetic field, it'll start to spiral. And then as it slows down, 
its spiral will get narrower and narrower and narrower. So instead of a circular shape, it gets you get a nice kind of spiral in of cloud. And so there's these photographs of essentially they look like ferns made of clouds that are generated, and they're essentially the paths of these charged particles as they move through these boxes. Yeah, I think I've seen seen pictures of that. It's ringing a bell. So this wouldn't detect a particle with no charge, for instance. If- yeah, that's right. They that's wouldn't ex- detect yeah. a particle with no charge. But yeah. sometimes neutral particles will decay to, say, an electron and a positron mm-hmm. or something negative and something positive, and then you can detect those. So right. what it would look like is... You see nothing, and then suddenly you have this vertex where these two particle trails come from. And if it's in a magnetic field, um, the two different charges will bend in different directions, and you'll get these two opposite spirals coming from one vertex. Looks kind of like the stem of a plant. All of a sudden, these two spirals originate at the same point, but one goes clockwise and the other goes counterclockwise. Yeah. Yeah. So, in essence, what this lets us do is it lets us piece together the decay of various particles. So, if you smash two particles together and you make a whole bunch of different, a zoo of different particles, you can kind of track them. You can say, well, the conservation of momentum tells us that some particles should move in this direction, and if nothing's there, then you say, well, maybe the particle is neutral. And then if that neutral particle turns into other particles, you'll see those charged particles moving in certain ways. And so you can interpret one of these big pictures of, you know, swirls, you know, using a ruler and a protractor. You can, you can interpret it to figure out what the particles processes involved. You can piece together the picture behind it. Have you ever had to do that, Ben? Uh, no. I, I did. <laughs> was it hard? One of the labs that I had in my undergrad, they actually gave us a number of pictures of exactly this, the trails, and said, tell us what interaction happened in all these pictures. That's amazing. Did you get to take the pictures yourself? No, the pictures were just given to us. So, But it was, it was wow. interesting, actually. It was, pretty, it was pretty fun. I don't know that that's what inspired me to go on in uh, particle physics, <laughs> but it was fun. Okay, so bubble chambers. Uh, clouds aren't very... High resolution, right? I mean, little motes of condensation. It's sort of accurate, accurate enough to to piece things together. But if you're going to do some really fine measurements, it's not quite accurate enough. So the next generation of particle detector that came out after the cloud chamber is called the bubble chamber. And in essence, you build a similar system where instead of air condensing, you're talking about a system where bubbles are about to form. They're on the verge of forming in this, but they don't really have a nucleus to form around. And box full of liquid has a higher resolution for uh, monitoring these things than a box full of gas. And so, Ken, have you ever dealt with a, a bubble chamber? Oh, that's a good question, Ben. My PhD thesis was actually about essentially a bubble chamber. Tell us more. It was the Picasso experiment, which is a dark matter search experiment in Canada. Oh, hey, I quoted that for my thesis. We got better limits for you for our dark matter search. Uh, I can't continue with this podcast. I'm sorry. (laughs) No, so it was a a bubble chamber, a superheated droplet detector. So what Ben was saying before, you have gas, which is super cooled. You can essentially do the opposite, which is you can have a liquid, which is at a temperature above that temperature at which it should boil. And it will be stable. It will be okay as long as it doesn't have any little thing which will start boiling. You can do that in the microwave, right? I was about to say, yeah, if you take a (laughs) very smooth container, usually you have to use Pyrex glass. You can actually heat water so that it's above its normal boiling point. And so if you then are foolish or very careful, you can drop something into the water and it will actually explode out of the container because it will instantly all boil at the same time. And it's a very neat and very dangerous thing to do if you have a lot of spare time, say, in a physics lab late at night when you're writing your thesis. And you say you can do this in a microwave. Yep. Like I said, usually Pyrex glass. Wait, don't do this at home, anybody. (laughs) Don't blame this if anything goes wrong. This has happened to just boiling water for my tea. Oh, really? Yeah, if you get a smooth enough container, the problem, yeah, you can't have any little nicks or scratches in your container because that will cause the water to boil at that point. Or even soda pop, right? Little bubbles of carbon dioxide form around the uh, the jaggy points on the inside of your, your glass, right? Their nucleation site. Oh, That's right. Oh, yeah. Anyway, yeah, you can do this in a microwave. I, I 
I think I have to say I don't recommend it, but for the adventurous or foolish, it's, it's something that can be done. So they use this theory. Essentially, if you have a lot of little droplets of liquid in this state, so in this temperature, which is above their, their boiling point, and you have a particle come through, it will actually cause that liquid to boil instantly. And so you can imagine that if you have, for example, in, in a perfect thing, you would have a grid of these particles, and you could just trace by looking at which droplets have expanded by boiling, you could actually follow a particle that way as well. And so that can actually be three-dimensional. You can follow it in all three dimensions by looking at these particles. So those are pretty cool. That's a pretty cool technology. Uh, so you have cool. to take pictures of those too, right? Yes. Yeah, you need, you need to be able to watch it somehow. So for your thesis experiment, did you have to take pictures? Of- no. So what we did was we actually put acoustic sensors all around and we just listened. Because when these little droplets, when they boil, they go 10 times or, or maybe a little bit more their original size. And you can actually hear a popping sound. So you can hear these little things pop, which is, which is pretty cool. So you would just triangulate the position based on the difference in time? Of- so that was certainly something we tried. So I don't know if this is too much of a diversion, but for my thesis, we only really cared about the rate at which these things popped. So, so you could just see how many particles had gone in. But we did eventually put nine acoustic sensors around and do exactly that. By knowing where the sensors are and looking at the time delay for the sound to get to each sensor, you can figure out where the droplet actually went off. Cool. So can you tell what kind of particle it is by the amount of boiling, or is it just that something went through there? That is a fantastic question. So just after I left, it was actually determined that you can do some particle discrimination by listening to how the boiling develops. So if you think of this droplet, as the particle goes through, if it's a background radiation particle, what we would call an an alpha particle, it will have a number of different sites where the boiling starts. So it's kind of like a line along which the boiling starts. And if it was what we were looking for, which was a dark matter particle or a neutron, more likely, they both interact the same. You would only have one site where it interacts inside your droplet. And these two things sound very different. So when I did my thesis, we only looked at the rates to try and tell the two particles apart. But as you say, eventually you want to find a different way to tell them apart. And this is the way that they are now able to tell them apart. Could you actually hear it or did you just have computers? We just had computers and looked at the waveforms. Yeah. I always wanted to try and make something which kind of made it audible that we could actually hear these things, but I never had the time to do it, unfortunately. It would probably just make a cracking sound. Yeah, I guess it would be something like that. Yeah. Like uh, bubble thunder. (laughs) Bubble thunder. That's fantastic. Yeah, that's what we should have called our experiment. So bubble chambers and cloud chambers are wonderful because they let you figure out where the particles are. They're very visual, but it's only as accurate as we can measure and take photographs and discriminate with our own eyes. It's very slow also. It's only as fast as it takes you to hire a bunch of people in order to sit there with their protractors all day and measure everything. So we can move to much more accurate systems using electronics. Let's talk about photomultiplier tubes. So what is a photomultiplier tube? Basically, it's this giant hand-blown glass bubble, and they paint the inside with this metal so that when photons hit the metal, it'll eject an electron. And then within the tube, you set up an electric field to attract those electrons from the outside surface. And those are attracted to this little metal piece, this dynode. That's right. It's a vacuum inside. So the electron is is drawn towards the first dynode just by the charge alone. And then it just kicks off more electrons from that piece of metal. That's right. Yeah. So it has a number of different stages. And at each stage, it gets more electrons, essentially. So it hits the metal in the middle, bounces off with a few more electrons, then they will come back and hit again and they bounce off. Is that right? You know, cascade. Yeah, you, you, you have a bunch of different levels of dynodes at increasing potential. So then each electron that bounces off of one will be attracted to the other. And yeah, you'll get more and more electrons. And then out the end of the tube, you get this electrical pulse. And we have technology to be able to process the signal. So Ben was saying that these helped with resolution, but they actually don't. It's much worse resolution. 
Because, I mean, they're these giant glass bottles. Right, okay. So they use them in Super K, right, Ken? That's right, yeah. Super K had them, and the really big ones. I think they were 22, 20 or 22 inch Yeah. Okay. Uh, across. So let's, okay, so there's this mountain in Japan called mm-hmm. Kamio God's Mountain. And inside of it, they, they've been mining for hundreds and hundreds of years. And so you can go deep, deep under this mountain. So the deal is that there's so much radiation coming in from the atmosphere that if you want to do isolated experiments, you need to shield yourself somehow from all of the incoming radiation from the atmosphere. And so one way to do that is to put yourself at the bottom of a deep mine. Sort of what they're doing with the dark matter experiments in Italy at the moment, the Gran Sasso National Laboratory. Gran Sasso, yeah. Exactly. So yeah, under this Camio Candy mine, they built essentially a big tank of water and surrounded the outside of this tank of water with photomultiplier tubes. So what happens is when, when a particle comes through, it'll kick one of the water molecules inside this big tank of water and emit a little bit of light, just a, one photon, almost undetectable. But this photon signal will travel out and hit one of these photomultiplier tubes on the edge of the giant canister And like I said, the deal with particle detectors is amplification. And the photomultiplier tubes let you take, you know, one photon, and that one photon will kick off an electron, and that electron will cause, like you said, a cascade until you get a really detectable signal. And from that, we can tell that a photon had come in. And from knowing that a photon had come in, you can tell where the particle kicked another particle inside the tank. Incidentally, there's this amazing story. Uh, so each of these photomultiplier tubes, like Ken said, it's a vacuum. It's like a great big light bulb. On the inside, there's no gas, but they're huge. They're these monstrous things. And so um, they were building a refurbished, much more sensitive version of this experiment called the Super Cameo Candy, or Super K. It was like they were just installing giant light bulbs around the edge of this giant cylindrical tank, and the tank was half full of water, and one of these giant bulbs caved in. Crack. And then the shock wave of that traveled through the water and caused its neighbors to collapse. Crack. You ended up with a cascading reaction where all of these different light bulbs ended up shattering because this one did inside the tank. And it was really sad because the tank was full of ultra pure water. And Yeah, it was delayed a couple of years because they had to hand blow all of those glass bulbs. PMTs again. I think it was like half of them were destroyed and there's like many thousands of them. Incidentally, we were in the basement of the physics building when I was at at university with Ken uh, several years back. I was wandering around the basement and I, I came across some particle physicists who were standing around a box containing one of these giant photomultiplier tubes and they were saying that if it caved in, the vacuum inside this thing is so large that if one of these were to crack and implode, it would implode with the strength of a quarter stick of dynamite. So, you know, we'd all die. Do you have any questions about photomultiplier tubes? I was, I was, yeah, I'm still visualizing them at the moment. I've got this picture of a sort of a, a light bulb with particles flying in the bottom. The analogy is actually not bad, because essentially a photomultiplier tube is an inverse light bulb. I mean, light bulbs, you give them electricity and they produce light. And photomultiplier tubes, you give them light and they produce electricity. So to first blush, it's actually kind of like a light bulb working in reverse. I'm also... Um Something Tia said about you shine light onto metal and it emits an electron. Yes. I'm just thinking, what's happening to my car when I'm driving around on a sunny day? (laughs) No, but that is happening, actually. Yeah, it's happening all the time. One of these amazing things in physics that's going on all around us and doesn't really affect what we do, so nobody knows. But don't worry, your your car shouldn't lose too many electrons because it's in contact with the air, so it can pull electrons from molecules in the air, too. Oh, right. All right. Photomultiplier tubes are are fantastic. They let us convert light into an electrical signal, and then we can use computers hooked up to clocks to figure out exactly when the mote of light was emitted inside the tank. What about charged particles? So before we were talking about observing charged particles, we talked about seeing them inside bubble chambers and cloud chambers. But if you want your computer to recognize that an electron has passed through, taking your computer and putting it up next to a cloud chamber isn't very helpful. So somehow you need to translate the fact that there's an electron moving through into an electrical signal that your computer can recognize as a muon. And we do it using scintillators. There's different kinds of scintillators. Basically, 
a scintillator is either a sort of plastic or liquid. It's made of a complex molecule that will absorb energy from a photon or an electron. But the special thing about this molecule is that when it de-excites, it produces a particular frequency of light. And that special color, the photomultiplier tubes can be tuned to detect that color very efficiently. So, Gareth, do you, do you have a dog? I have a cat. Have you ever had a dog? No. Ugh. All right. For the purposes of this experiment, shall I pretend I have a dog? Yeah, yeah, pretend you have a dog. Make us some attributes of the dog. So, you know, at night, there are all sorts of sounds in your house. How do you know the difference between a truck passing by and somebody breaking into your house? If you have a dog, the dog's going to bark. And regardless of the stimulus, the dog is always going to bark with the same bark. You can recognize your dog's voice, in essence. Yeah. So what the scintillators do is they kind of transform any incoming stimulus, right? So somebody smashes a window or delivers the newspaper. Whatever happens, the dog's always going to bark the same way. And so you don't need to listen for crashing windows. You don't need to listen for newspapers being delivered. The only thing you need to listen for is the voice of your own specific dog barking. So what scintillators do is they let you transform all of this variable information into very specific information that you can then turn into an electronic signal. Except humans are good at telling the difference between the newspaper being delivered or someone breaking in. But a computer's not good at that. The computer needs a dog. And that (laughs) dog is the scintillator. Right. But there's another cool piece of technology to transduce light into electricity, right? And that's like CCDs in a digital camera. So this technology came about originally for telescopes to take images of the sky. Someone made a lot of money and made digital cameras for consumers out of them. In these cameras, you have a semiconductor. If you just add a very little bit of energy, you get an electron popped off of one of the silicon atoms in there and a positive hole where it is. And then you can drift these charges to a plate and accumulate charge. From that charge, you get your pulse and you can send it through a computer again. So that's kind of the idea of how digital cameras work. Do you want an analogy? Analogy is always helpful. Yeah. Oh, this, is, this analogy is great. I just came up with it. Okay, so... Oh, no. Uh, <laughs> I'm scared. So imagine that you have a room full of people with dogs, okay? That's your semiconductor. And everybody has a dog on their leash. And at the south end of the room, there is a hot dog garbage stand. So like dog heaven. All of the dogs want to go to the hot dog garbage stand, but they can't because the, the, the human is holding on to them on their leash. So what happens is a photon comes in. So one of these particles comes in, a particle of light, and it smacks the person in the head, bang, and he drops the leash. As soon as he drops the leash, his dog is going to run to the other side of the room, to the hot dog garbage stand. And so he doesn't have a dog. And so he looks around, because he wants a dog, and the closest dog to him is the one immediately opposite him from the hot dog garbage stand, because the dog closest to him on the other side has a dog that's, like, you know, pulling on the leash in his direction. So he grabs that dog, and then he has a dog. But the person he stole the dog from doesn't have a dog. And so he looks around to grab a dog, similarly sees a dog in the other direction, grabs it. So in essence, there is a signal that's composed of people who don't have dogs, and is propagating away from the hot dog garbage stand, whereas the dogs themselves are moving towards the hot dog garbage stand. And so you're seeing two signals moving in opposite directions from each other. One of them is the electron. One of them is the hole where the electron used to be. And so they get sucked in opposite directions, and you can detect that as an electronic signal. It's called a charge couple device. And in in essence, yeah, so it was used um, to replace photographic plates when they were doing astronomy. Because it lets you, for instance, take long photographs without having to change photographic plates. And you can print them out, go send them straight to your computer, and let your computer analyze the stars instead of you having to develop the plate and then give the plate to a student to count to see how many stars are on it. 
And so the deal is that it's a wonderful technology because just like the photomultiplier tube does, it lets you convert uh, light photons into an electrical signal. So the moral of the story is we have a few different tools They'll give a really strong signal when a particle comes in and rings the bell. And what we do is, in more modern physics, we combine them in certain ways that let us figure out how the particles move through a system. So enough talking in vague terms. I guess we should talk about CERN, right? Yeah. 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 So, yeah. so all of these different detectors we talked about are all used to create the big giant detectors at CERN that have been responsible for discovering new particles, especially this new boson that they think may be the Higgs boson. And these detectors are combined into layers, layers like an onion. I think a little bit of preface in terms of what the particle detectors do depends on knowing how CERN vaguely works. Do you know... Uh, Gareth, what the deal is with CERN? Yeah, it's like two giant Hot Wheels tracks, and you fire a car off in either direction and smack them together. Brilliant! So, these particles are going to, you know, uh, it's fine-tuned, so we know exactly where the particles are going to smack together. So, at the location where they're smacking together, what happens is, they'll smack together, they'll, in essence, turn into quantum question marks... And then that will explode in a whole bunch of different types of particles. And we can figure out what happened inside the explosion by looking at the different particles that come out of it. And so what we do is we build these huge particle detectors centered around where these you know, streams of particles are going to collide. We know exactly which location they are, and so we know exactly where to look to see uh, all of the interesting bits. Okay, so at that location, we're going to build one of these particle detectors. All right, Tia. Okay, so at this collision point, we can imagine the two protons that you have coming in to collide with each other. You can imagine the beam pipe is along a pen, if you have a pen. And around this, we're going to build our detector. So the ink in the middle of the pen would be where the silicon tracker is. So that's just like the camera that we talked about. It uses the same technology with semiconductors, and you can see particle tracks with that. And then the next layer, the outside of the pen, that would be your electromagnetic calorimeter, which is made out of scintillator and photomultiplier tubes. And those are good at detecting electromagnetic particles like photons or things that have charge, like an electron. And then if you wrap your right hand around your pen, your right hand would be the layer of hadronic calorimeter. A hadron is just something that's made up out of quarks. So things that are made out of quarks deposit a lot of energy here. And again, this part of the detector is just made out of scintillator and PMTs again, or a version of the charge coupled device. And then if you take your left hand and wrap it around your right hand for the outside layer, this hand is the muon chambers. And those are like one of the first detectors we talked about today, the Geiger counter. So these have strips and wires that are charged sitting in a gas. And when the gas is ionized, the electrons will go toward the wire and produce a signal. So from all of these layers of detectors and all of the many wires and outputs that you have, many millions of channels coming out, we can effectively take a 3D picture of the explosion of particles coming from the center. Did you get all that, Gareth? Did that make any sense? I think so. So it's kind of like you get a car made of Lego and you blow it up to find out all the different types of bits of Lego that we use to make it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you've seen probably the a photograph of the Atlas detector, right? Yeah. It's the big, it's like a long tube, but it's kind of octagonal. And uh, yeah. Beaker got sucked into it in the latest Muffet movie. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the deal is that it's made of different layers, and the different layers in it look for different things. 
So some of the material made up of the, you know, the Lego car explodes. Some of the pieces, the two peg pieces, they're not going to travel very far in this detector. And some of the pieces, like the mighty eight peg pieces, they'll travel all the way out to the outside. And so the different parts of it are composed to look for different particles. Because we know that if it makes it all the way out to the outside layer, it's got to be a muon. It's got to be one of those eight peg Lego blocks. So... Like Tia said, it's each layer is composed of a different type of detector, and we put things like magnetic fields between the layers to help sort the different types of particles. So when we were talking about cloud chambers, right, you could you could put a magnetic field through, and then the size of the spiral would tell you the mass of the particle. Similarly, if we put magnetic fields in this thing, uh, different particles react in the magnetic fields in different ways. And so when your Lego car explodes in the center of it, all your computer is going to see is it's going to say, oh, well, one particle exploded here, and I registered another particle over here, and I detected another particle over here. And from that information, it interpolates the trajectories of all these particles and essentially draws a really, really accurate version of the same spirally diagrams we saw in the, in the cloud chambers. And so from those spirally diagrams, we can figure out, you know, which particle was which. You can say, okay, only weird pions can make this type of track, and only protons make this type of track. And so you can filter through and say things like, oh, look, there's this weird gap. That's the Higgs boson. Right. And that's how the uh, detection came about. I've seen the sort of multicolor firework burst pictures that they came from CERN when they made the announcement. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it's funny because we basically have pictures that look very similar to the old cloud and bubble chamber photographs that we took. But instead, it's just all in the computer and super fast now. Well, that was fun. So thanks, Ken. Thanks, Tia. You've pleased me. Your efforts have borne fruit, and that fruit is sweet. Here's some fruit. Tia, you get a hot dog. Nom, 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 nom. And Ken, you get the canine's other favorite treat, garbage. Mmm, tasty? Yeah. All right. I'd like to thank my guest, Gareth L. Powell, the author of Ack, Ack, Macaque. Thanks, Gareth. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for, thanks for explaining it to me. Yeah, I hope you had fun. All right. So, hey, TIE Fighters, listen. I love the show, and I hope you do, too. But for every listener to the show, I know that there's got to be a hundred other people who would love to listen, but they don't know how. So I want you to spread the word about our show. There are three ways you can do this. The first is iTunes. It's still the biggest place in the world where people go to find new podcasts. And iTunes puts shows with the most ratings at the front where everybody can see them. So if you've got a minute, give us an iTunes review. It'll increase our rank in the stack and more people will end up seeing us. The second is to teach people how to listen to podcasts. I know this sounds weird, but everybody nowadays has a smartphone or a tablet, and a very low percentage of these people actually listen to podcasts on them. So, if you know somebody who might like the show, ask them if they know how to listen to podcasts, and if they don't, point them to the Stitcher app. It's free and easy to use, and also it works on every handheld device. So, tell them to take the Stitcher app, download it for free, and look up our show. Surely, your grandmother will thank you for it. Now, the third way to spread the word is to tell people online about us. The internet is full of explanations about physics. If you see somebody on the internet talking about a topic one of our episodes cover, post a comment telling them about the show. It'd be nice if people started treating podcasts like their reference material. Anyway, that's it. I hope you'll help us out and point new listeners in our direction. So that's it for the main part of today's show. Remember that if you like listening to scientists talk about science in their own words, you might enjoy listening to other shows on the Brachyloop Media Network, like the weekly Wienersmith or Science Sort Of. So editing of the Titanium Physicist podcast is provided by a gentleman named John Heath. Thanks, John. The intro to our show is by Ted Leo and the Pharmacists, and the end song is by John Vanderslice. Until next time, remember to keep science in your hearts. Don't be mine There's something I gotta tell you, dear Before you come back here I lost, I lost your bunny I let him out of the cage He was eating spring mix on the carpet 
Jump through a window out into the haze. Hop down Magnolia Boulevard. No way he'll survive. I remember my grandfather used to have a luminous watch from the 1930s, I think, and he, he said that the reason it was luminous was that the, the numbers were drawn on in uranium. I, I never knew if that was true or not. Oh, yeah, the ladies that used to paint the watch faces, they used to lick the tip of the brush to paint the uranium on there. Oh, good Lord. And then they all got tongue cancer. It's one of these big uh, workers' rights issues in the history of bad it's employers. It's like the Mad Hatters. That's right. It's astonishing what people did, but wow. So Can we so, add a clip? Can we add a clip of a Geiger counter clicking? No, but yeah, yeah, Gareth, do you know what a Geiger counter sounds like? Yeah, goes, yeah. Tick, 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 and then you put it next to like the uh, the person who's horribly radioactive. You know, you you go around to where like Godzilla stepped, and it's like tick, 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 and that's as close to an audio clip as we're gonna get to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that's an audio clip, <laughs> I suppose. Even when you don't have this device near uranium rocks or, I don't know, Godzilla's footprint, if we're going sci-fi, you'll hear periodic clicks here and there. And it was discovered that there's natural radiation in the soil, of course, and then also that there's cosmic rays. Do you know what percentage of natural radiation is cosmic rays? In terms of like your daily dose of ambient radiation. Oh, that's an interesting question. I suppose that would depend where you live, because if you live somewhere like in the UK, like Cornwall, which is a lot of it on granite, you're going to be getting a lot more. They have problems with, I can't remember the name of the gas that is naturally emitted through the ground and comes sort of seeps up oh, through the houses. Radon? Radon, radon. Yeah. radon. yeah. Yeah. That's it. So, you know, I suspect if you lived there, the percentages would vary a great deal than if you lived out, you know, somewhere less radioactive. There's, there's, uh, Tia mentioned cosmic rays. So in essence, there are all these uh, high energy particles bombarding the Earth from outer space. So if you go up high in the atmosphere, you'll get a huge dose of radiation as well. So airline pilots get <laughs> irradiated because they spend so much time in the higher levels of the atmosphere. And if you go up on top of a mountain, you'll get bombarded with natural radiation just as much. And it's, even though it sounds natural, it's just as... Maybe we shouldn't call it natural radiation. It's just as just as harmful as regular artificial radiation, I guess. <laughs> right. But you can't avoid it. <laughs> yeah. Sweet. Okay. Have you got any other questions, Gareth? I see we've gone on for about an hour, so we've probably got enough content. Uh, no, I think I, uh, my mind is reeling. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so it's, it's, no, it's fa absolutely fascinating. It was um, I, I didn't get very far with physics at school, but uh, I have become interested in it in later life through writing and reading science fiction. So, sort of, I have a kind of a very lay person's knowledge of it. But uh, science yeah. fiction is a wonderful way to get physics across because, I mean, the way the way to properly learn physics is to to crunch through the mathematics, right? But behind all the mathematics, there's always a story and always a very straightforward explanation. Uh, now, the details of those are always really complicated, right? That's what the mathematics is for. But you can always, you know, a, a decent story writer uh, who has a grasp of the, the subject can always incorporate these explanations into it in a way that's intuitive. So, you know, it, uh, mathematics shouldn't be a limitation on being able to learn how the universe works, I think. That's good, because I'm absolutely appallingly bad at maths. That's fine. You write books about monkeys <laughs> fighting with knives. Yeah, that's because I can't do maths.